Hello, my beloved people. Thank you for hopping on this one because it's going to be very special. I feel like, you know, when you walk with the Lord, sometimes you think just because you know it that other people should know it. And the sad truth is that there are, I would even say, hundreds of thousands of people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ that don't understand fully this key that I'm about to tell you. We're going to be doing Keys of the Kingdom Part 4. This is a very basic teaching, but bear with me because even hopefully I can do this under an hour. I don't, I try to keep these videos about an hour at the most, but to speak on righteousness, you can speak for hours and hours and hours because it is one of the major things that the Lord has given to us. One of the ultimate, one of the ultimate points that God gave his son on the cross was so that we could have righteousness, right standing with him. I want to talk about how it's used as a key, but first I need to explain what righteousness is and what Christ accomplished. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of people who don't understand what it means to be right in God's sight. Sadly, a lot of people just believe that because Jesus died, we get forgiven of our sins and we get to go to heaven when we die. And that is the most watered down, watered down gospel message you can receive because it will limit you as a son or a daughter to step into the fullness of your identity as one of God's sons or daughters. Righteousness, if we don't grasp on how to posture ourselves and what it means to yield yourself to righteousness and allow it to live your life, to allow righteousness to live through you. Because righteousness is not just something that was given. Righteousness is a person. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is righteousness. And because he is righteousness, and through the cross, he puts himself inside of us. When we yield to him and we become one with him, righteousness begins to live through us. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. The word of God says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way. They cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law, trying to do things. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which that law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. First of all, righteousness is legality. It's a legal system of operation that God gives to us. Righteousness is being right in God's sight, legally. The reason it has to be legally is because God rules and operates as a kingdom. And within a kingdom, there is laws, there is decrees made. And if you break or come against these laws or decrees, there is punishment. There is justice. So to be right in God's sight, 
we have to receive what Christ did. Because it says here, Christ has accomplished this purpose for why the law was given. This law talked about that these Pharisees were trying to follow to be right in God's sight was given because of the sin of man, the sin of mankind. Legally, if you break the law, you are judged. The law was put in place to reveal sin because without the law, sin would be okay. If you think about it in today's terms, with how, let's say, democracy or, or how a government operates in this generation, if you murder somebody because there's a law, you cannot murder or you'll go to prison or you'll face death penalty or whatever, whatever state you're in, that law is put in place so that you can't do it. So if the law wasn't there, you would be able to because there's no form of government or higher authority telling you that you can't. So it doesn't deal with the, the wickedness of the act of murder that's in the heart of man. It just deals with the punishment and the, just, the justice act put in place to take you away and to not allow that to happen in the community. I hope this is making sense. The law doesn't do away with sin, it exposes it. It reveals that it's there. So it was put in place legally for those that trespassed to be judged. Now God doesn't like judging people, but he had to put that in place so that it wasn't okay to live in sin. Sin exposes the heart of man. The law against sin exposes the heart of man by our actions. To be legally right in God's sight in the old covenant, God put in place and spoke through his prophets that, look, we have this now, yes, but there is someone coming and he will fulfill all things. He will be the one that gives himself as a sacrifice so that sin can be done away with and as you allow him to live through you righteousness will prevail I love how it says here the Pharisees in the scripture the Pharisees they are zealous for the Lord they loved God they wanted to obey God but their zeal was misdirected because they were trying to follow the law of Moses and they didn't have the revelation of Christ and what it meant to live by the Spirit because it was not yet given. So they thought they were doing God a favor, but in reality, they were destroying the thing that God was lifting up for people to look to and to be saved. God wants us to be saved from our sin. He wants us to be healed from the effects and the stain of it. He wants us to be delivered from our sin so that it no longer rules our life. But His Spirit rules our life and directs our every step, even the words that come from our mouth. Because if God is living inside of you, and you yield yourself to that and it becomes reality in your life, you will begin to live in union with Him. Righteousness will prevail in your life because you're no longer yielding to the sinful nature, the desires and the impulses of sin, but the desires of the heart of the Father, the desires of God according to your purpose so that you can fulfill your destiny. So that you can fulfill your destiny Romans chapter 4 verses 5 through 8 says, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. 
Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That is what I want to emphasize in the scripture. To whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. That word impute, it means to attribute or credit to. It can also mean taking something, sticking it into something, making what you stick it into something else. So God imputes righteousness through our faith. Our faith is a currency that activates the prize of God's righteousness to be pushed inside of us. So you don't have to work for it. You don't have to try to be a good girl or a good boy and try not to sin. But activating faith towards what Christ accomplished for his spirit to be given to you. For righteousness then to give birth within you. And it's your job and your responsibility to yield yourself to that. And let it begin to rule you for the rest of your life. There's no patty cake back and forth but a complete surrender to the Spirit of God within you. And as you yield yourself to that and identify with that, even if sinful things try to rise up in your life, let them rise so that God can cut them off instead of trying to hold on to them and keep them within you because it will be a terrible battle. The flesh has always been hostile to God. It's always been contrary to God's will and His ways because it contradicts His heart and His nature. Always will, always has. So when you allow righteousness to prevail in your life and you identify with who you are as a son of God now that Christ is inside of you by him giving you his spirit, the flesh can then be done away with because you won't be feeling it. You won't be putting gas in that tank anymore. Therefore, those desires, those urges, they will begin to die. God will purge them out of your soul as you allow the Spirit of God to be the river that you drink from. When it comes to the truth of His Word, when it comes to the flow of the glory of His presence, when you yield yourself to Him, it begins to water the garden of your heart. It begins to give nutrients to the word of God that you have read and that you have read and meditated on so that it fills your heart and it begins to give birth to something new. It takes time and it takes an understanding to yield yourself to this for it to manifest to be made known in your life. It is our faith, our faith. It is a believing, knowing that it's there even though you don't see it yet. A lot of time with new believers, there's a back and forth battle because there's doubt. There's a lack of faith in what Christ accomplished. Probably most of the time it's because it's not preached properly for people to respond the right way. Here in the American church in this generation is a patty cake, McDonald's, quick fix, in and out, sugar-coated gospel that makes you feel like you get to live your American dream, to have your best life, but not completely surrender to the teachings, to be in complete obedience to what the Lord Jesus Christ taught how to even yield to the Spirit. The discipleship, the sacrifice, the surrender, that must take place for the promises of God to be active in your life. Now when that gospel is preached because it was what the Lord taught us and how He tells us to surrender and yield ourselves to Him. If that's not being preached, people won't respond the right way. If it is being preached, not a lot of people will. You'd be surprised that people still want to live their own life. 
that they don't want to fully give themselves to God. They would rather treat him like a prostitute and use him for the night, use him for what they can give, but then forget about him and continue to do their own thing. And that's why you don't see the power and the reality of God in your life. If you use him for what he can give to you, treating him like a genie in a bottle, That's why we're still sick. That's why we're still confused, have anxiety, fears. It's because of our pride and our self-righteousness. It's because of our doubt and inability to surrender completely to the Lord. But the moment you do that, I'm telling you, everything changes. Faith begins to rise up in your life and that currency of faith becomes strong and it begins to purchase the realities of heaven on earth in your life as an individual. It is a very beautiful thing. It's our job to stay there. It's our job to continue in the gift of righteousness. It is something that you have to yield to every day, but the more you yield to it, the easier it becomes because God begins to work on your heart. He begins to purify you. You begin to see him. You begin to encounter him. You begin to realize that he's actually real, that he's not just a made up story or he's not just some powerful God to someone else's testimony, but not yours. When God becomes real to you and tangible, everything changes because you have no excuse any longer. It gets to a point with encounters that you see too much and know too much to go back. Jesus. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9, the word of God says, And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You know what that is saying? That's saying that you don't have to die to receive the resurrection, but you can die to yourself now and receive the power of what the Spirit does and that resurrects our soul. It catapults us into our destiny. It resurrects our mind, our emotions, our desires and our urges. It gets filled with joy, hope and peace for the future. On the basis of our faith, the currency of heaven, it activates the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. Do you want to be resurrected by the Spirit of God in this generation? Yield yourself and ask the Lord to resurrect you through a complete surrender. There are many churches that call themselves Christians or believers in Christ, whatever you want to call it, but they don't believe in the power of God's Spirit being active, alive today. You know what that's called? That's called an antichrist church. Why? It doesn't say anti-Jesus. They'll say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all day, even worship with Jesus' name. But their antichrist, which is the anointing that was upon Jesus that activated him to do what he did. If you don't believe in God's ability or his spirit to deliver us, to save us, then you are anti-Christ. And let me tell you, you do not want to be in that boat for what's coming. You do not want to be in that place. And let me tell you, the Spirit of God won't always move like how you've seen in the past or what you expect Him and try to control Him into. He will move however He wants to. 
And a lot of times he does the way he does out of our expectation is to destroy our dignity and our pride. The moment you think you know God, he'll do something to destroy that. The Bible says knowledge puffs up. When you think you can get a grip of who God is and what he is capable of, in the sense of being able to make a doctrine and to shun out anything else that actually could be him because of what he's trying to do in this generation, It's pride. Now, through the word of God, we can understand God's heart and his nature, the way he thinks and he functions to be able to follow Christ, to yield to him, to walk in the fullness of what he paid for, yes. But the moment we try to put him in a box because we think, oh, this is how he operates and this is only how he should, is the moment he lifts off of that and you get to do it on your own because you can't control the Lord. He must be the one controlling you. I don't know if my pastor made this song, but we sing it or we worship to the Lord with it. And it always touches me. It goes, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. I will follow after you alone. If the Lord is moving in the cloud to something else, we must posture ourselves to follow him or else we'll be left in a wilderness place, very dry, where the spirit of God is not flowing. Yes, you might go, you'll go to heaven when you die. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's not the purpose for what Christ paid for. We have to reveal him on this earth. We have to be completely surrendered to him. Every day, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Are we happy with a little appetite, just a little bit of presence sprinkled on? to our weak, but we still have issues, we still complain, we still get discouraged, it's all about us still. Jesus, help. It's fellowship of his sufferings that creates the pattern of resurrection power. Christ said, follow me. Do what I did and even greater. Because Christ is a pattern, a spiritual system. That when we follow it, we receive the same exact thing. It's almost like a mantle. The way Christ walked to receive what he received, we must yield ourselves and walk the way he walked for that pattern to grip our lives, to see the manifestation of what was given to Christ, what was given to us. To be resurrected, you must go through the sufferings. We, we were not promised everything to go perfect. The word says we're promised persecution. If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us. But because we have his love and we have his presence, we will be able to endure and overcome. It is an aspect of God's nature to prevail, to persevere like an ox to carry the burdens, to plow through the rock, through the hardness of hearts, to break open the atmospheres of darkness. The sufferings of Christ creates a pattern for resurrection power. 
Be careful not to get too familiar or comfortable with going to church. It will turn into a system of laziness to where you're not seeing spiritual maturity and growth or more authority added onto your life. Yes, go to church, but throughout your week, make sure to spend time in the secret place. Make sure you are actually having a genuine connection with the presence of God when no one else is looking. If you don't have that, you will not go far in the Lord. You will plateau, you will become religious, and you will have issues. There's grace for those who are humbled to hear this, to want the reality of the truth that I'm speaking. And God will meet you with his love. But I speak the way I speak to expose the flesh, to expose self-righteousness and pride. Those things, you will, they will destroy you. They will put a veil over your eyes. Now that I've explained righteousness a little bit, I want to talk about <laughs> how it is used as a key because this is keys of the kingdom. And remember, keys are used to unlock and to open something to be received or to step into. Psalms chapter 85 verse 11 says, Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Righteousness looks down from heaven. It is the key of righteousness. It is given to us by our faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished. Like I was saying earlier, Jesus is righteousness. And to receive what Christ accomplished unlocks inside of you the door to receive right standing with God by our faith. When you understand that Christ lives inside of you, you know, we need to meditate on that for it to be real to us. I see it in a lot of people that it's not yet. The outside distractions and the pressures of emotions and all of this stuff is more real than the reality of them understanding God lives on the inside of you. that God lives on the inside of you. We must be caught up into his glory. We must understand that the governmental power of his kingdom lives on the inside of us. That's where authority sits. That's where he is enthroned. Everything that you need is on the inside of you. It's just a matter of consciously shifting into the arena of your heart. Shifting into your spirit. There's so much distractions that keep us from being still and knowing, the word says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Be still. Be still. Does that just mean physically? Your emotions must be still. Your urges, your desires must be still. Your mind must be still. Your imaginations must be still. For the glory in your spirit to flow into your soul that your soul would be still and know that God is inside of you. It's not so much of the physical realm that keeps us locked up, stagnated under pressures that bring heaviness and cloudiness. It is our soul that is experiencing that. I caught this revelation a while ago when I realized that my schedule was like, I made it 
to be to where I, it was, there was no excuse for me to not be okay. I had the right sleep, I had the right food, I had the right exercise, and I was still feeling such a pull of heaviness on my life, keeping me from, from praying, keeping me from yielding and being still. It was impossible, it felt like. It was because my soul was locked up. And it was because of my inconsistency that kept that stuff alive and active in our lives. My life, but our lives as a body, as a people, because of our inconsistency, we don't receive the nutrition. Our soul is malnourished. It's not receiving the glory and the light to sustain it enough in a day to be able to dwell in the peace that God promises. Righteousness, when we put it into the door of our heart and we unlock it, it reveals and positions us to be able to receive all that Christ has promised. I felt the Holy Ghost on that one. Let me say it again. Hmm. When we receive righteousness as a key in our life, when we receive Christ and we step into righteousness when we allow it to live through us it opens up every realm ability that God has promised to us that includes his power that includes ascension that includes hearing him seeing him feeling him tangibly being led by God That's a promise of authority, the ability to minister, to reveal his name, to reveal his face into creation. And because of that, we receive the fullness of joy in our life because we're no longer focused on ourselves, trying to work to receive the peace, the love, and the joy that our soul craves. We find it in him. When you begin to walk with the Lord, you begin to realize that love, joy, and peace, it begins to flow through your life effortlessly when you begin to follow the will of God for yourself, for your purpose to be fulfilled. It becomes effortless because you're yielded to Him and it begins to make everything a path for you to walk on. He does it. He's the one. It's his power that works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he gives us the key of righteousness. And if we use that key properly, everything that God promises us is able for us to step into by faith everything that he's promised. It's a very beautiful thing. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 2 says, Ill-gotten gains do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Righteousness delivers from death. Hmm. The key of righteousness not only opens up God's ability in our life, relationship and union with Him, it also shuts the door of the stain, the effects of sin that leads to death. Now we get to choose and we get to pick what house we live in what door we step into. Righteousness, the Spirit of God living in us and through us, conforming us back to God's image and likeness, or living in our sin, 
which leads to death, which is separation from God. There is no life in that. There never will be. There will always be hardship and pain and brokenness because sin cannot produce life, only his spirit. And when we yield to his spirit, he works righteousness in us and through us. He works himself in us and through us as a potter molds clay. He turns us into a masterpiece. He turns us something so broken, something so far from God, back into the glory of being one with Christ himself. I love telling people this. Jesus was the son of God. We are sons of God. Because the word said he was firstborn among many. We are the many. He is our example. That's what God created us to look like. He was in complete union with the Father. He was led completely by the Spirit. He was tempted beyond all points without sin. He had to go through the wilderness. He had to deal with temptation. He had to deal with the flesh. He had to go to the bathroom. He had to take a shower. He had to work. He got hungry. He got tired. But he was living his life receiving from a source beyond this physical realm. Because the Lord laid his life down, we must lay our lives down to receive the resurrection power of transfiguration. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17 says, And the work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. What is this saying? Well, number one, if we don't have peace in our life, we need to check ourselves and see if we are working for what God has promised. Did that make sense? Because if we don't have peace, it's because we've postured ourselves in works, still trying to work to please God to be right in his sight. You turn into a Pharisee. Trying to work the law, trying not to sin. Instead of allowing God's spirit to purge that sin out of you, yielding to his spirit, he works right standing with you and God through you. I remember in my life, I don't know if this was because of the demonic stuff that was upon my life or just the systematic way that my mind thought and the way that I lived and the way that I postured myself and the way my mind worked. I was so systematic. I felt like I had to get point A, B, C all in a row for it to work, whatever I was trying to accomplish. So that mindset I brought into the kingdom to, accomplish, to, to, to work, I felt like I had to fast a certain amount of days. I felt like I had to pray a certain amount of hours for me to achieve something. Now fasting and praying is so powerful when it's done with the right motive and intention. When we fast and we pray, it is to expose our heart to where we are able to posture it the right way, 
for God to be able to work on it because it exposes the flesh and it causes you to respond without having your comforts and your lusts. It reveals how selfless you truly are and how devoted you are to wanting God's will. But I did it in some cases for the wrong reason. And because of that, I didn't see the effects of it. I just felt irritated, hangry, hungry and angry. But that, that anger exposed my heart and it made me realize I still got some flesh. My flesh is lusting after something to make me feel good. The lie of believing that we're always, we always are gonna have urges and desires lustfully is a deception, it's from the pit of hell. Christ did not lust after any woman. He's seen them for their destiny, who they were, and the spirit and who God created them to be. And loved them selflessly, not selfishly for what he could get from them. Okay, let's go back to righteousness before I start spewing off and doing something else. <laughs> If we're not careful, religion and trying to work will lock the door to the promises of righteousness. If we're not careful, our duties and what we do for God will take the place of knowing Him and receiving the true bliss and glory and peace that comes from His presence in the midst of pressures and trials and persecutions. I'm telling you right now, I think I've said this three times already, it's just so strong, it's right here in my belly. When we completely surrender to the Spirit of God, the life in the river that flows from God's throne begins to become alive within us. We begin to tangibly experience the life-giving flow of God's glory, His peace, His presence, revelation, visions, a constant flow of life ever expanding. That will change your life. That will change how you view, view life. That will change how you see God. That will keep love alive inside of you. A lot of times when people get discouraged and they get irritated quickly, it reveals their lack of intimacy and union with the Lord. It reveals the lack of love. A lot of times that's rooted in the person not loving themselves because they see they have issues. And instead of dealing it with, bringing it to Christ and dealing with it, they harbor those things because they don't love themselves. When you experience the constant flow of God's glory and His presence inside of your soul, it keeps you in the place of wonder to receive revelation and mysteries. Because when you're in the place of bliss and joy, when all hell is breaking loose around you, it won't be able to affect you because you're so fixed in the wonderment of God's glory and presence. That's what every single person must tap into to live their life in Christ and to let righteousness live through them. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33. Jesus said this, and I'm going to leave it at this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His kingdom, his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. 
all these things. That includes how you're gonna pay your bills. That includes your relationship, marriage, the food on your table, the clothing that you wear, the opportunities to prosper and whatever you may do in life, the materials that are needed. When you work for those things, there will be, it, it will cause stress. When you yield yourself to the kingdom of God inside of you and live from that constant flow of glory filling you, God will bless and will lay your life out to where you don't have to beg. He will bless you and prosper you because you're yielded to his love and that is what you're focused on. When you're focused on other things, you're not focused on his love and his glory. So it will be very choppy. It will be you're in it for a moment and then the rest of the day, it's not like how it was. So we have to bring our secret place into the rest of our day. There has to be a constant flow of union, consciously yielded to that. To live in the bliss, to live in the ecstasy of God's presence is to have a subtle, conscious awareness of his presence there, yielded to it, but functioning through your day. And as you practice that, it becomes stronger and it begins to envelop your life. You become intoxicated with the love of God, the wine of his presence, to where you don't have to drink or smoke physically, but internally, God gives you the drunkenness and the glory, the joy, you know when people are drunk, they're, they're so full of faith, they think they can say anything and they can do anything. Especially when it's, when it's ghetto and like you think you can fight anybody. <laughs> but when you drink of the presence of God, when you drink of the tangible presence and glory in your life, it activates faith to be able to draw from heaven to activate and operate in the gifts of the Spirit in every situation, it begins to leak off of your life and touch those around you, creating an atmosphere of God's presence because of one simple thing and that is union with His presence throughout your day. And that's the only thing that you strive to accomplish in this life. It should be that and that is union with the presence and glory of God on the inside of you allowing that to ravish your soul, living in constant union with his presence. That is the hardest thing to do for some people because of this thing up here, the distractions, the cares of this world, emotions, strongholds in the mind that keep us bound to turning inward and in experiencing the glory within. The key of righteousness activates and opens the door for everything that God has promised for our lives to experience as individuals. Righteousness is legally being right in God's sight as God works in you to stay in the place of righteousness where you don't have to work for it. Stay in his presence, stay in his glory. Cry out for that, hunger for that, desire for that. Holy Spirit, I pray through this revelation and understanding that you bless every single person with the conviction to be still and know that you are God. Give grace, power to those who are humble to receive this word in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
If this has blessed you, please like it and share it to someone who might need to hear it. Shalom.